There are two commands to the suffering church in this letter. The first one is, verse 10, listen to this now. Jesus said, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. And the second command is down at the end of verse 10, be thou faithful unto death. You're suffering, you're going through poverty, you're under persecution, I got two words for you, don't be afraid, be faithful. Thanks a lot, pastor. Just what I needed to hear. You got anything more for me than that? No, nope, that's what the Lord said. Don't be afraid, just be faithful. Now wait a minute. Doesn't it make you mad when somebody does that to you? You pour out your heart to them, you tell them how bad things are and how you're hurting and you want them to say something that will encourage you, at least give you some idea that they've identified with you and they come up with one of these pat answers. Don't be afraid, just be faithful. Now wait, but that's what the Lord said, isn't it? That's exactly what he said to the church. Don't be afraid, just be faithful. Not long ago, when we were experiencing some difficulty in our own lives, one of my friends said it this way. He said, you know, Pastor, when you get at a time like this, what you need to do is tie a knot in the rope called faith and hang on with both hands. Don't be afraid, just be faithful. But if you were living in Smyrna, and you couldn't get a job, and everywhere you went, you were the target because you wouldn't worship the emperor, would that do anything for you? I just went to church and heard the preacher preach, and you know what he told me? He said, don't be afraid, just be faithful. Haven't you got anything more for me than that? But you see, the letter does say that, doesn't it? Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. The church in Smyrna was to face the trials with the same courage that David wrote about in his famous hymn, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what's the rest of it? I will fear no evil. Robert Murray McShane observed, how sweet and how comprehensive were these words of comfort. They were to fear none of these things, the smallest or the greatest of them. They were to be courageous. These are the same words that the Lord used to encourage John. Look back in the first chapter. Remember when John saw the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory and he was afraid and he fell down as one dead? Verse 17 says, and he laid his right hand upon me and he said unto me, fear not. Don't be afraid. Suffering and imprisonment and martyrdom are to be met with Christ's gracious word, fear not. Somebody told me a long time ago that there are 365 fear nots in the Bible, one for every day of the year. I don't know if that's true. I, I tried to count them one time and I got mixed up and discouraged and I quit. But I don't know if there's 365, but there's a whole bunch. And every time you look in the Bible, if you read very far, you're going to read. Don't be afraid. If ever there was a word for this day, that's the word. Don't be afraid. Fear not. And then he said, be faithful unto death. Now, there's some disagreement about what that means. Some people say it's intensive and some people say it's extensive. Watch this. If it's intensive, it means be faithful even though they kill you. If it's extensive, it means be faithful every day of your life till you finally die. Or whether it's extensive or intensive, it means the same thing. Be faithful. You see, what happens when the pressure's on and the persecution comes, you want to flee. You want to run. You want me to worship the emperor and I can have something to eat? <laughs> Where do I sign? When the pressure's on, don't you ever feel like you just like to get out from under it? Go someplace where there isn't so much. Take on an easy job, pastor a church with a cemetery beside it. But you see, the message Jesus gives to the church, listen to me now, is not see what you can do to get away from it. The message is be faithful in the midst of it. And ever we needed a message like that, if ever I needed a message like that, it's today. It would be so easy to try to find a place where there isn't any pressure, where there isn't any persecution, where there isn't anything going on, where Satan leaves everybody alone because they're no threat to his kingdom. But the message of Jesus Christ to every one of us, no matter what our difficulties are, if we're walking with him, is you stand in there straight and you be faithful. It's what we learned when we started this. It is between suffering and sovereignty is steadfastness. But you see, if you're going to be fearless and faithful, you need some reasons. Lord, what can you give me that will help me? And as I've gone through this text, I just want to leave these thoughts with you because there are several things that are here in the text that surround these two commands and reassure us 
that in times of suffering and persecution, we can be fearless and faithful. There are basically four or five statements that the Lord makes, and they're given to the church to help them fear not and be faithful. In many respects, these statements are principles of life that are set in contrast to the lifestyle and the culture that confronted the believers every day of their lives. Here's this great Roman city of, of Smyrna. Beautiful in all of its architecture and the temples and all the rest of it and wealth personified. And here are these poor Christians going through terrible suffering. And Jesus says, be fearless and be faithful. Let me tell you why. Number one, the reputation of Christ is better than the reputation of Rome. Watch this now. How did Jesus address the church? He said, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. The title was chosen by the Lord from the vision of chapter 1, and it was meant to disarm fear, even as it was clearly marked out to do back in the first chapter when it was written. Smyrna was a perfect church to be so addressed. In her suffering and persecution, she needed to be encouraged by the one whose name transcends all of the limitations of space and time. Christ was the first in the dawn of creation, and he will be the last at the end of creation. And this claim to eternity is based on the resurrection of Christ from the dead. The eyes of the church that was suffering were to be fixed on the mighty fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What he is saying in this is this, through all of the trial you shall ever have, I am the beginning and the end of it. I shall be the end of it, I have been the beginning of it, and I shall be there all the way through it. I am the first and the last, I have been dead and I am alive. And when the Christians in that little group in that church heard these words, what came to their mind in my estimation is this. The citizens of Smyrna who fought against the believers and slandered them with false accusation and scorn stood in proud opposition to these humble believers. After all, their city was the first in all of Asia and the culture was the last word. Were they not the city that had died and come alive again? How proud they were and the more to be despised were these peasant believers. And Jesus said to them, fear not and be faithful. You need to be courageous because you are citizens of another country. And the country where your citizenship is, is presided over by a king, an eternal God who has been dead and come alive. He was their resurrected savior and they were to take heart. You see what he's doing? Jesus is giving this little band of suffering believers something to grab onto in contrast to what everything around them is saying. The reputation of Christ was more important than the reputation of Rome. Notice number two. The recognition of Christ was better than the recognition of Rome. There's just one little phrase in this passage of Scripture that has brought me to tears more than I'd like to say as I have read it. We passed over it, but I want to go back to it. Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know. I know. Does anybody understand what I'm going through? Does anybody care what's happening to me? Do you ever say that? Here's the Lord Jesus saying to the suffering believers, my dear brothers and sisters, I know. In the original text, in many of the best manuscripts, the words, thy works, are not there. They're in some of the manuscripts, but they're not. And so if that's true, if that's the way it should be read, then what Jesus said is this. I know thy tribulation and thy poverty. I know the blasphemy of them which are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. What Jesus is saying is, I understand what you're going through. And the word for know is not the word that means just to know about it or to be aware of it. It's the little word oida, which means to know by virtue of having experienced it. What Jesus is saying is, is they're suffering with poverty and persecution and all of the things that have pressed down upon them. He says, listen, I know. I understand. He had been there, you see, before them. Just as John was their companion and brother in suffering and in tribulation, Jesus was also their companion and brother in suffering and in tribulation. What kind of encouraging words these must have been to those believers? 
What a tower of strength to that suffering church and suffering Christian. I know. Here is the mighty God and the suffering Savior saying, I know. He knows the intensity and the duration of our suffering, and he allows not a tear too many and not a blow too severe. He knows everything that's going on, and he presides over it personally. And my friend, if you're suffering, if you're under pressure, if you feel like everything is going the wrong way in your life, the Lord Jesus who wrote to the church at Smyrna knows you. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows how much you can take, and he won't let you have one minute more than what he will equip you to deal with. I know. Did he know? The one who lived for three years under the daily sentence of death says, I know your pressure, your thlipsis, I know. The one who had no place to lay his head and was poorer than the foxes and the birds that he himself had created said, I know your poverty. The one who had been hounded, falsely accused, whipped, lied about, brutally beaten, and hung on a Roman cross says, I know your persecution. Hebrews 4.15 says this, don't you love this verse? For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. When you go to Jesus and you tell him your problems, my friend, you're talking to a brother who understands. Frank Tadford, who's written a great little book on Revelation, says it this way, listen carefully. He says, he took cognizance of every sorrow his heart felt every pang. He counted every tear. The weight of oppression was fully known to him, and the wealth of his divine sympathy went out to his people. And still today, not a trial passes unnoticed, nor a difficulty unobserved. Our great shepherd knows every bruise sustained by his sheep and every suffering experienced by them. And because he too has passed through suffering, he sympathizes with his own. End of quote. The believers in Smyrna weren't recognized by anybody in the city. They were looked down upon. Oh, there goes one of them. Yeah, that's one of those Christians. They had no standing whatsoever with anybody in the city. They were the off-scouring of the culture. Nobody knew them by way of notoriety. But you know what? They had something better. They were recognized by Christ. The recognition of Christ is better than the recognition of Rome. Notice the third thing. The riches of Christ were better than the riches of Rome. There's a little parentheses in that verse, verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, parentheses, but thou art rich. Now you talk about contradictions in the Bible. There's one right in the same verse. How can you be poor and rich at the same time? These words were meant to strengthen the church. Though they were poor, yet they were rich. You see, the Lord values things differently than those of the Jews and the paganizers. Somebody told me one time that the world today is like somebody going into a hardware store at night, taking the tags off of all the merchandise, and then taking all the high-priced tags and putting them on the little nuts and bolts and all the little small item prices and putting them on the lawnmowers and all the big items. And somebody comes in the next day and says, you know, this whole thing is messed up. All the values are wrong. That's what's wrong with this world, isn't it? Everything is all topsy-turvy, inverted, wrong. The things people value, they discover at the end, aren't worth anything. And the things they neglect and don't put any value on at all, they find out in the due course of time, that's the most precious thing they have. Now, what is Jesus saying? Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 6.10, and this is what he said. Listen carefully. True ministers of God will be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. You remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians when he was talking about Jesus Christ? He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Now watch this. That you through his poverty might be rich. How are we rich? You say, Pastor, I feel like a Smyrnian. I haven't got two dimes to rub together. You telling me I'm rich? I'm glad to find out. Where do I go to check this out and to cash in? Well, let me show you a little contrast. You got your Bibles open to the second chapter. The last church that John writes to in behalf of the Holy Spirit for Jesus Christ is the church at Laodicea. Turn over to chapter 3 and notice verse 17. Now, this is what he says to that church. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now watch carefully. The church in Smyrna 
was poor but rich, and the church in Laodicea was rich but poor. You see it? The church in Laodicea, which represents the end time church, had all kinds of material wealth and, and all kinds of uh, assets. They had everything in the material world. They were rich, but they were poor. And the church in Smyrna was the persecuted church. They didn't have anything. They didn't have a place to stay. They didn't have any food to eat. But the evaluation of Christ is say, well, yeah, they say you're poor, but I tell you, you're rich. How are they rich? Well, they're rich as we are rich in Christ. We have treasures laid up in heaven, don't we? Everything that is ultimately important to us is ours by virtue of Christ. They can take everything else away, but they can't take that away. If you have Christ, you have everything that's worth anything. The Christians of Smyrna were to take heart and be faithful. Spiritual inventory was good. And it offset the empty coffers of the church and encouraged each of them in their struggle with personal poverty. When's the last time you took spiritual inventory? All right? Fear not. Be faithful. You've got Christ. His reputation is better than Rome. He knows your problems. His recognition is better than Rome. You've got all these riches. They're better than the riches of Rome. Now notice number four. The reckoning of time by Christ is better than the reckoning of time by Rome. Here's an interesting little statement tucked away in this letter. It says here, Verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. I don't know if you understand what Jesus is saying to this church, but let me just stop for a moment and explain. Here they are going through suffering that they thought was really bad. And Jesus comes to them in the letter and he says, well, if you think this is bad, let me tell you how it's going to be. It's going to get worse. Watch this. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. What does that mean? What does it mean, 10 days? Well, some people believe that means that they were going to have 10 years of tribulation in Smyrna, that the days represent years and that for 10 years Smyrna was going to suffer. History doesn't necessarily bear that out. Almost every book on the book of Revelation uh, has it this way. Since the church represents a period of time in history, it points out that the 10 days represent the 10 persecutions that the church went through under 10 emperors, ending with Diocletian who was the emperor right before Constantine came and married the church and the state together. And then they say, and under Diocletian, there were 10 years of persecution under him. So what the text is saying, according to these prophets, is that when Jesus said you're going to have persecution for 10 days, he was saying uh, in a symbolic way, there's going to be 10 waves of persecution. Under Diocletian, there's going to be 10 years of persecution. And he well may have meant that. But as I study it, here's what I understand. I think I see what the Lord is trying to say to this church. Listen to me now. The intent of his words are to prepare the church for suffering that would be very brief in contrast to eternity. One day is with the Lord is how long? You know, isn't it interesting that God doesn't keep time the way we do? He's not subject to time. Time is no big deal with God. And so he says to this church that's suffering, number one, listen to me, it's not going to last very long. If it lasted all their lifetime, it still wasn't very long, but I don't think that's what he means. He's saying, you are going to suffer for a little while. Isn't it interesting that the Lord is in charge of the duration of our suffering? He told them, here's how long it's going to last. How do you know, Lord? Because I'm in charge. Lord, let me out of this. I want to get out of this situation. I don't like this pressure. I don't like this problem. The Lord says, I'm in charge. You get in the vice of God. You can kick and scream all you want. He won't turn you loose till he's done with you. He's in charge. He's got the days numbered. And I love what Paul says. Listen to this. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Listen carefully. We don't have time to turn to it. For our light affliction which is but for how long? A moment. Works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The moment and eternity are in contrast, aren't they? You're going through some tough times. I know something about that. But it's just a little time. It's just a short little blip on your chart, and it'll be over before you know it. In this life, probably, but if it's over in this life, it'll be replaced somewhere along the way, because nobody gets from the cradle to the grave without some of it. Nobody. 
But even if you have it all your life, it's just a short little time in comparison to eternity. And it's numbered and limited by God himself. Can you imagine if you lived in Smyrna under pressure, didn't have any money, and always being jabbed at by those Jews who were putting you down? Can you imagine how slow the clock must have turned? You know, we've got this saying that, you know, time passes fast when you're having fun. Well, the converse is true. It goes slow when you're in trouble. Can you imagine how slow the clock, you know, it just seems like it just drugged by. But Jesus said to them, listen, my clock moves in a different way. And I want you to understand what you're going through is only as much is I'll let it be just 10 days and then it's over I heard somebody say that nothing ever comes to your life that doesn't pass first through the hands of the Lord and the timing of it too the timing of it one last thought fear not be faithful why hey the reputation of the Lord's better than the reputation of Rome recognition by the Lord's better than being recognized by Rome the riches of Christ, oh, they're far better than the riches of Rome. Number five, the rewards of Christ are better than the rewards of Rome. Two little snatches from these last two verses. I will give you a crown of life, and he shall not be hurt of the second death. Let's look at those just briefly. The athletic games of the Roman Empire were a cause for much pride among the citizens. Part of the pride of Rome was attached to the great pageants of their games. And the crowns won by the Roman citizens were flaunted in the face of the believers. But they were reminded by Christ that there was a different race and they would win a different crown. And the crown of life was theirs if they would be faithful unto death. James 1.12 says it this way, Blessed is the man that endureth trials, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. I heard a testimony not long ago given by a woman who was trying to say a good thing about a friend who had done a lot for the Lord. And she said, you know, uh, I think about that person. And I think about that person when they get to heaven, they're going to have such a heavy crown for all the things they've done that, that they're going to have an awful time carrying that thing around for eternity. And I want to jump up and say, wait a minute, hold it. That's not the way it works. You ain't going to carry it around for eternity. Revelation 4.11 says you're going to cast it at the feet of Jesus. What are you going to do when you get the crown of life? You won't be in heaven very long before you'll bring that to the Lord and say, Oh, Lord Jesus, were it not for your shed blood on the cross and your sacrificial death for me, I wouldn't even be here. Here's my crown, my gift for eternity to you. And Jesus said to those suffering people in Smyrna, Listen, don't be afraid, be faithful, because there's a crown waiting for you when you get to heaven. Isn't that a great thought? Did you ever get left out? And then it feels, really feels bad to be left out, doesn't it? Did you ever go to a party where they didn't have enough candy for everybody? And they got around to you and it was all gone? I remember that happening sometimes when I was a little boy. You know, you really feel bad. What I remember more than that is showing up at the gym a few minutes late and only, only 10 can play and you're number 11. So you've got to wait out for all the games. And there's just, you can't, you're left out. I don't want to be left out when they pass out the crowns. Sometimes when you're tempted to give up and you want to throw the towel in and you want to run or get out from under, just remember this. You're building up points for the great day of reckoning with the Lord. And if you are faithful and fearless unto death, one of these days you're going to stand before the Lord and he's going to give you a crown of life because you were faithful in your life and you were fearless in the midst of trouble. And you're going to put that crown at his feet as your gift of love back to him for what he has done in your life. But I like the second part of that reward thing even better. It says here at the end of the chapter, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. What do you think was on the minds of the Smyrnian believers through all the days of their time in Smyrna? I wonder if this is the day they'll get me. I wonder if I'll end up on the rack today. I wonder if they'll take me to the stake and burn me alive. I wonder if this is the day I'll be thrown into boiling oil or thrown into the Colosseum for the hungry beast. I wonder if this is my day to die. Jesus said, let me tell you something. Hey, 
They can take your life, but they can't take it twice. <laughs> you will never be hurt by the second death. I love the words of Luke 12, 4 and 5. Let me read them to you. Be not afraid of them that can kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. I will forewarn you of whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. That's what Jesus is saying. Listen, they can take your life if they want to. If they boil you in oil or they throw you to the beast or whatever they do, all they have done is ended your physical being on this earth, but they will never touch your spiritual life. Whoever is an overcomer shall not be touched by the second death. You know what the second death is? Here's an easy way to remember it. Death means separation. That's what the term means. Physical death is the separation of the soul from the body. Spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God forever. The first death, you don't have to fear. My friend, if you're not right with Christ and you die the second death, you are going out into eternity forever and ever in a Christless hell, never to see God or any of his influence again. That is the second death. That's what you need to fear. You know how you fix that all up in a neat little formula? Watch this. If you're born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you only have to die once. Did you know that? If you're only born once, if you've only had a physical birth, then my friend, you will die physically and then you will die spiritually. One death, two deaths. But if you've been born physically and then you've been born again spiritually, the only thing you ever have to fear is your physical death. And you may not even have to experience that because the Lord could come back first. What did Jesus say to that church? He said, listen. As you walk around in this city and they're threatening you with your life and saying you're going to get the oil next week or we're going to throw you to the beast, don't you worry about it because if they take your life, they've just ushered you into my presence. They'll never touch you with a second death. I tell you, when you know that, when that's really internalized in your life, boy, do you have courage. You can face anything. Nobody wants to die. I heard about an old gentleman that came to some of his Sunday school students one time and he said to them, uh, you boys want to go to heaven? And one of the kids said, not me. He said, to the other kids, he said, you don't want to go to heaven? No way. He said, son, you don't want to go to heaven when you die? Oh, he said, yeah, when I die, I thought you was getting up a load for today. <laughs> hey, that's the way we feel, isn't it? We don't want to die. But on the other hand, we don't have to fear death, do we? Because death just means... Absent from the body, present with the Lord. So these six principles were given in the letter to encourage them. Here's what Jesus says to people who are suffering. Are you ready? Be fearless, be faithful. Because the reputation of Christ is better than the reputation of the world. And the recognition of Christ is better than the recognition of the world. And the riches of Christ are better than the riches of the world. And the reckoning of time by Christ is better than the reckoning of time by the world. And the rewards of Christ are better than the rewards of the world. You can be courageous in the midst of anything when you know those truths.